Okay, we're still missing some folks, but I think we have a quorum. <laughs> Matthew chapter 1, there's a, a point that I want to go back to because I forgot to mention it yesterday. And I find it extremely interesting. I kind of laid the foundation for it, but didn't uh, go through and explain it. So I was talking about the genealogies of Matthew chapter 1. Uh, relating from Abraham to the Lord Jesus Christ, again showing that he is a uh, legitimate heir to the throne of David. He's the son of David. And I made mention that this is an exhaustive list of the genealogies or the names. There's holes in that. And there's a reason for that. Uh, if you got the book on numerology, uh, when you look at the number 14, you'll realize that 14, when used metaphorically in Scripture, has uh, the emphasis of salvation. And so we read in verse 17, so all the generations from Adam to David are 14 generations, from David unto the captivity in Babylon, 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon unto Christ, 14 generations. Well, actually, there's more than that. Uh, but that's what the writer is uh, giving as evidence that the Lord Jesus is a descendant. He's the son of David. He's skipping generations because he's emphasizing the number more than anything else. 14 is the number of salvation. Now, David, David, uh, three Hebrew letters. We have uh, Dalet, which is four. If you're not familiar with this, the... <coughs> Uh, the Hebrew numbers, they don't have a numerical system like we do. They have numerical values associated with letters. And so when you're looking at big numbers in the Old Testament, that's just a series of letters. And that's why um, those are the easiest things to miss copy. For example, if you compare the numbers between Kings and Chronicles, there's about one-sixth that there's a disagreement on. But normally you can just say, well, that's clearly uh, a copying error because reason, you know, the 50,000 men of Bethshema look in the ark or 70. Okay, well, that's a no-brainer. So all this to say that David, uh, Dalet's four, Bob is six, and Dalet, four. So David's name adds up to the number 14. Three is the number of uh, perfection, the essence completeness. And so what Matthew is showing in these genealogies is that the son of David is God's complete salvation. And see, that's how he's using the numbers here. He's, he's purposely skipping generations to uh, highlight the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, is God's perfect salvation. Isn't that cool? That's all for nothing. No extra for that at all, right? Mark chapter 1. I just find it so fascinating how the Lord has used layers and layers of revelation and scripture to make us excited about his son. And I think we ought to be excited about the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 1. And I want to start with reading verse 1. We saw in Matthew, the emphasis is the son of David. We're going to see in Luke, the emphasis is the son of man. We're going to see in John, the emphasis is the son of God, his deity. Uh, Mark is different. Mark is going to show us the lowly servant of Jehovah, the Lord Jesus Christ. But I find the way that Mark begins his gospel account very interesting. He says in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. And then he goes on to speak of the, the coming ministry of John the baptizer as Christ's forerunner. So it's interesting that although Mark is going to present this lowly uh, vantage point of the Lord as a, as a servant of God, he guards against having a demented view of the Lord Jesus. He is the Son of God. He willingly humbled himself. But it doesn't have to do with the fact that he is any less God. He is God's Son who willingly humbled himself. 
And just notice in chapter 1, so we have the ministry of John the Baptist highlighted, fulfilling the, the prophecy of Jer um, Isaiah 40. He's preaching. Uh, we see that he baptizes the Lord Jesus. And right after that, the Holy Spirit is going to anoint the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Lord's baptism in verses 9 through 11, and immediately after he comes out of the water, um, well, let me just read verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heaven parting and a spirit descending upon him like a dove. And this had, John explains this. This was a sign to John the baptizer. This indeed was God's son, the Messiah. Then a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And in verse 12 and 13, we have only two verses. It talks about the temptation of the Lord Jesus. And uh, notice in verse 13, he was there in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan. I think the Lord, the Satan was, was adding the whole 40 days. What we have recorded in Matthew 4 that we looked at yesterday is just the the grand finale of that testing. And the Lord was proven. 40 is the number of probationary testing in Scripture. And so it was appropriate for the Lord to be tested for 40 days. So we're at verse 13, and we already have Lord in his ministry. And this really highlights the um, kind of the demeanor of Mark's gospel. Uh, he introduces the Lord. He's the Son of God. And then he talks about John the Baptist ministry, the baptism of Christ, the temptation. And, and by verse 14, uh, we have the Lord preaching the kingdom gospel throughout Galilee. So not much introduction in, in Mark's gospel. No genealogies, nothing about the Lord's birth. He's getting right down to work. And that's the kind of the uh, theme that Mark's going to pick up is, is the serving saviors is pouring his life out day after day, showing compassion to those who would receive a blessing from him. All right, so Mark portrays uh, Christ as a lowly, meek servant. It's interesting in Mark, uh, I count 39 parables, uh, four parable series in Mark, a total of nine parables. So less than one-fourth of the parables that Christ told are in Mark's gospel. Again, Mark's more streamlined. Uh, the parables by nature were uh, stories that were veiled to some description. Um, Mark doesn't seem to have a lot of time for that. And the parables that he does mention have to do with action, which we'll see in a little bit. Mark's depicting Christ ministering to the chosen people. Matthew has Christ testing the nation of Israel. I say unto you, when they obey his voice. We don't have that uh, authority of strain in Mark's gospel. Uh, the Lord says serving, 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 having compassion, blessing, and so forth. Uh, Mark is addressed to the Roman audience where Matthew was distinctly Jewish. I said, um, I can't remember what I said earlier, half the Roman Empire was slaves. About 120 million people in the Roman Empire at this time. So, the way that Mark is approaching his presentation of Christ is going to be have a real appeal to his Roman audience. Again, half of the, those in the Roman Empire were slaves. And we have the Lord Jesus being presented as the slowly servant. Um, this is a translated inscription from uh, a calendar in uh, Priene, which is an ancient city in southwest uh, Turkey, and it reads, Divine Province has now set the world in perfect order by bringing into existence Augustus, whom she filled with virtue for the benefit of humanity, sending to us and to those after us a Savior, who ended war and put all things in order. And when he appeared, the Caesar surpassed the hopes of all those who anticipated such good news. The birthday of the God, Augustus, was for the world the beginning of good news. 
right? So that's what's being spoke of Augustus, Caesar, who was ruling when the Lord uh, came from heaven and was born of a virgin. And so that's the mindset of the Roman Empire. The Roman sit had deified some of the Caesars, like Augustus, calling him the good news that had come down from heaven, you know, the blessing of the gods. So Mark starts out speaking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the beginning of the good news, the gospel. You see what Mark's doing? He's, he's pounding right against the Roman ideology of the day. Augustus isn't the good news from heaven. Jesus Christ is the good news from heaven. And so gospel is mentioned uh, right up front in verse 1, and then also again in verse 14, Jesus came from Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. So uh, you have to kind of understand uh, the ideologies of the day, the political ide ideologies of the day, and the, the way Mark starts his gospel, what he's highlighting right at first, makes a lot more sense. Again, no genealogies, uh, no mention of Christ's birth, childhood experiences. Again, that information is not needed to substantiate Christ as a humble servant of the Lord. Uh, is necessary, Matthew, is necessary, Luke, but not in Mark's presentation. There's no Sermon on the Mount. We saw Matthew, we got chapters of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel. Again, it's Jewish in nature. Uh, it's the Kingdom Manifesto. Those who are in Christ's Kingdom are going to behave this way, and there's these blessings. Now, the Kingdom right now is in its spiritual state on earth, and we who have the Holy Spirit can reflect the character of that Kingdom now. Praise the Lord. But there's a day coming when that uh, kingdom manifesto is going to permeate the whole earth, and the, the glory of God will be seen as Christ is on the throne. I already talked about only four parable groups, but notice that the parables that are in Mark, uh, working, um, a lamp, speaking of testimony, seeds planted, being fruitful, planting a vineyard, and so forth. Um, Matthew will record, like in the planting of the vineyard, a householder, but Mark is a certain man. Householder has authority. In Matthew's account, we see all Christ commanding the angels, but when angels are mentioned in Mark's account, uh, they're, they're ministers to Christ. Again, a different demeanor uh, than what Matthew has as the authoritative of, uh, power of the king. Uh, there's no sentence passed on Israel, no woe message to the Pharisees, or Christ weeping over Jerusalem. That's very appropriate in Matthew's gospel. Uh, the, the Lord is he's looking over Jerusalem from Mount Olives. He's weeping, oh Israel, I would have gathered you as a hen, would have gathered chicks on my wing, but you would not. You stoned the prophets I, I sent to you. You killed them. You rejected me. And uh, by the way, I believe those were literal literal legitimate tears that our Lord shed for the nation of Israel. No fakiness about that, right? There had been a legitimate offer of a literal earthly political kingdom. Israel had rejected uh, Christ because they, they didn't want the spiritual overtones that Christ was demanding in, for, in order to receive that uh, kingdom. Humility, humbling oneself, repentance, believing on him uh, as he is being presented from heaven. Divine and exalted titles are very rare in Mark. Uh, Matthew, we read, he's Emmanuel, God with us. Um, Matthew, we saw the son of David referred to 10 times, uh, but in, in Mark, only once. There's no enlisting of a, of a king. Um, let's just take a look at this. I want you to notice the... Um, differences in Christ. I'm going to, we often refer to this as Palm Sunday, which is a religious term. It's really his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Uh, Matthew 21, 9, just so you can see how the writers are highlighting different aspects here. Matthew 21, 9,
I'm going to start in verse 6. The disciples went as did Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid the clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Okay, and then Mark <coughs> chapter 11 Verse 9. Then those who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Do you see the difference between Mark and Matthew? Uh, Matthew calls out, the son of David, Hosanna to the son of David. And Mark doesn't mention that. Talks about the kingdom, but not specifically the son of David. Actually, I feel led just to have a little devotional thought on this. Turn with me to Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Verse 22, the stone which the builders rejected, he is become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you. From the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, and He has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with the cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. And so, what we just read in, in uh, Matthew and Mark was a quotation from Psalm 118 uh, that's for previewing the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem and, and the people, the crowds calling out to him, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, he is the stone the builders rejected. Uh, we have that several times in the, the New Testament. The kingdom was being offered to the Lord. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to go to the cross. He's going to die. He's going to suffer for sin. He's going to be raised up. And then this uh, church is going to be uh, created in the life of Christ. We get to enjoy that. And he's building this spiritual temple uh, called the church. He's the cornerstone. So when it says, this is a day which the Lord has made, we rejoice and be glad in it. Now we sing praise songs. And it was like, oh, each and every day the Lord made it's a great blessing. Well, that's true, but in the context of this passage, this is talking about a particular day, the day that the Lord Jesus Christ would go to the cross and suffer for sins. Now, what I think is astounding about this is the, the Jews traditionally would sing the Hallel uh, on Passover. The Hallel was Psalm 113 through 118. We know that from Matthew 26, 30, that before the Lord and his disciples, minus Judas, left the upper room, and then they went down across the Kidron and up to Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane, that they sang a hymn together. If they followed the Jewish tradition of singing the Hael, it would have been Psalm 118 that they would have sang. It's quite possible that the last song that our Savior ever sang on earth was Psalm 118. Now, listen to what the Lord would have been singing. This is a day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, Yasha, salvation. Now, na, Yasha, na, Yasha, na. But see, in the Greek, that's Hosanna. 
That's what they're singing here. Uh, Yashana, Hosanna, Hosanna. I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then look at verse 27. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus singing this? Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt me. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. That's what they did. The, the sacrifices were taken to the north side of the altar. They were bound there. The, the priests would slit the throat and, and collect the blood. And the Lord Jesus is singing, bind the sacrifice to the altar. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You are my God. I will do. These are the things that the Lord would have been going through his mind just right before he went to Calvary. So what they were saying, Hosanna, is salvation now, salvation now. Well, they were looking at their salvation, and a few days later, they were going to crucify him. All right, little tangent, but anytime we can just appreciate the Lord more and more, I think it's worth uh, looking at. All right, so let's continue on in uh, Mark's gospel. Um, Note the difference in the Lord's words at his transfiguration. So let's look at Matthew 16, 28. So this is uh, right before... The transfiguration, he says, Surely I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Okay, that's Matthew's account. Okay, now let's look at Mark. Mark 9, 1. Again, right before his transfiguration. And he said to them, But surely I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. It's a difference, isn't it? Seeing Christ coming into his kingdom. That's Matthew's presentation. And Mark is just uh, simply recording that the kingdom of God will be present with power. And again, this is the, uh, the flavor of the two different presentations of Christ. Mark the lowly servant, not the presenting Christ as the king in authority, but the lowly servant of the Lord. Uh, note the manner in which the disciples address Christ. In Mark, when you're comparing the same stories, and you're going from Mark to Matthew, Matthew, often the word will be Lord. But in Mark, it will be master if you have King James or teacher or New King James. Not as authoritative. And so there's a number of examples of that uh, in when you're comparing uh, the different texts, same stories from the Gospel of Matthew to the Gospel of Mark. So, no introduction, abruptly brought in to the beginning of Christ's ministry, quite different than Matthew's presentation of the Lord. Uh, but the first verse in Mark guarantees or protects the uh, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark starts out, the Son of God. He humbled himself, but he is the Son of God. I found this very fascinating in doing this study. There's two Greek adverbs, utheos and uthus, and if you look at all four Gospels, you'll find that these occur 19 times in Matthew, 46 times in Mark, 10 times in Luke, and only seven times in John. Now, Mark's the shortest gospel count, 16 chapters. And so we have these two adverbs 46 times in the gospel of Mark. Normally, they're translated forthwith or immediately. And so what Mark is showing us is a Savior that is every day he's pouring himself out. He's doing this, and he's doing this, and he's doing it quickly and forthwith. He's just pouring himself out day after day after day. Um, and as I said earlier, no wonder he fell asleep in the stern of a boat during a storm. I think the Lord Jesus uh, often was in a state of exhaustion. People coming to him night and day. The only time that he really find escape was 
the early morning hours to go pray and be with his father. And there were times that he prayed all night. Um, that's an exhausting thing if you've ever done that, to pray through the whole night. And yet, I think this was the, the day, this was, uh, faith, these were regularities that marked the Lord's life. And again, 12 to 16 chapters beginning with um, the word and or now conjunctions, he's constantly serving. Mark contains few parables, but a lot of miracles, more than Matthew. Mark frequently mentions the hands of the Lord. And this is often omitted in other accounts. So, for example, let's look at uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 31. This is the healing of Simon's wife's mother. Verse 30, we read that she lay sick with fever, and they told him, that would be the Lord Jesus, about her at once. So he came, the Lord Jesus came, and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served him. Now, if you compare the other gospel accounts, you will not read that he uh, reached down and touched her and took her by the hand. He just commanded, and, and she was healed. But this is the, um, Mark is constantly uh, showing that the servant of the Lord is looking over the landscape to see how he can help and bless others. And he's not afraid to touch people. And I find that these are great incentives to reflect Christ to the unregenerate. Uh, I think so often we, we're afraid to touch people. We're afraid to get close to people. We're afraid to rub shoulders with the unregenerate. And uh, Mark is showing us a very touchable, compassionate Savior. And so when we're willing to be an emissary of Christ and get get down in the dirt with people that are suffering and, and be willing to help and show compassion. It's a real reflection of the power of Christ in our lives. So um, this is quite often, verse 41, Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I'm willing to be cleansed. Well, here's a leper. If you touch the leper, you became unclean. The Lord's not afraid of that at all. He's, here's this man, probably hasn't embraced his children, his wife, for a long time. Been out of touch with uh, human touch. And, and the first thing the Lord does, I, I will you to be. And he touches him. And how much love was communicated in that human touch. He had compassion on him. When, you're, when you look at the other accounts uh, in Luke and Matthew, this had compassion is left out. It's not in the text. Mark brings this up over and over again. Uh, look at Matthew or Mark 5, 41. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha, kumayai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl rose and walked. Mark records the fact that, that he... He touched, he took the child by the hand. Again, these details are, are missing from the other gospel accounts. So uh, this touching and this, this compassion is something that, that Mark uh, brings out quite often. Mark 3, verse 5. I'll start at verse 1. He entered into the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand, so they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath, and so they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. When he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out, and his hand was restored whole as the others. Mark records the eyes of the Lord looking around. Again, this is the human element. Mark is showing a, 
a very touchable, compassionate servant that's pouring himself out, doing this, doing that, day after day. If you want a good model of a servant, Mark gives us, I think, the ideal model of a servant by upholding the Lord Jesus for us to follow. And I found studying the attributes of what Mark brings out a very convicting study in my own life. How well do I reflect the servant heart of the Lord Jesus in what I do? So let's just go through some of these. First of all, we read in Mark uh, 1, 36 through 38, uh, he was going from village to village preaching the kingdom gospel, and his disciples say, all men seek thee. In other words, he was pouring himself out, going from place to place to place. He was tenacious in ministry. Uh, he just didn't uh, work three days a week and then take a long weekend, right? Uh, he was pouring himself out in the work of the Lord. Well, how did he respond to the disciples when they said, all men seek for thee? Lord says, let's go to the next town. He wasn't looking for a popularity. Uh, he wasn't trying to win a popularity contest. He wasn't trying to uh, lure the, the, the crowds to himself. He had a mission to perform, and he was out there doing it. All men seek me. Let's go to the next town. Now today, the natural man, the carnal man, says, oh, I like crowds, right? And, and we feed on that. The flesh feeds on that. But the Lord was, I have a mission to do. I need to preach the kingdom gospel throughout all Israel. Let's go on to the next town. So he was tenacious. He did not seek popularity. He was tenderly. We, uh, we saw that when he healed Simon's mother's, uh, Simon's wife's mother, he personally touched her. Again, Luke doesn't record that. Of course, miracle, but not that the Lord touched him. Uh, Continues this, uh, serving despite opposition. You know, I don't care what you're doing, but if you're serving the Lord and the good of your calling and you're walking with Him and the power of the Spirit, you're going to have opposition. The enemy is out there trying to oppose uh, those that are reflecting the Lord Jesus Christ in their day to day testimonies. So let's take a look at this. Uh, Mark chapter 2. The Lord had constant opposition in doing the will of the Father. Mark 2, verses 6 through 7. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemy like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Verse 16. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Then when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well need not a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's just a short little rebuttal, and I think probably cut to their hearts. And... So as he's going through, Mark is really highlighting the fact that the Lord was being opposed constantly to the mission that he had. People were speaking behind his back. They were speaking to the disciples against him. Uh, they were sometimes face to face confronting him. Is that something that we should expect in our ministry? Should it discourage us? If we're doing what God wants us to do, and again, we're walking in the good of our calling, we're walking in the Spirit, we're in communion with the Lord. I think of Moses um, in Exodus 33 after the golden calf incident. He makes intercession for the nation of Israel. God receives that. And then God says, okay, we'll take the people north. And Moses said, listen, uh, if your presence doesn't go with me, there's no reason to go. <laughs> I, I'm just going to stay here. And we really ought to have that kind of thinking in each day. The Lord said in John 15, 5, without me you can do nothing. And so if we don't have the Lord's presence with us as we're going, it's just not worth going. If he's not in it, the, the ministry and our work's going nowhere. And so the Lord is showing us that he was a praying um, he was praying with his father, getting his marching orders for the day. He was walking in fellowship with his father, fulfilling his will, 
And as he's doing that, he's having day after day of opposition. I mean, we should expect that from the enemy. If nobody's attacking you, nobody's confronting you, then there's a problem, right? John Wesley, when he was riding around the UK on horseback, uh, there was a particular time which he suddenly realized that in three days he'd had no persecution, no rocks thrown at him, no stones. And so he got off his horse and he started praying, Lord, show me my sin. There must be something blocking my ministry here. And there was a rough fellow on the other side of the head, hedge that heard this Methodist preacher uh, talking to God. And, and so he picked up a, a rock and threw it at Wesley. Well, thankfully, the rock missed the Methodist preacher. But when Wesley looked at that rock, he said, praise God, it's all right. <laughs> And that's really that if, if there's no opposition to what we're doing, there's something wrong. Because if we're standing for Christ, reflecting the character of Christ and what we're doing, that the devil hates it, and he's going to oppose that. So I just want to give you that as encouragement. If however you're serving the Lord, you're facing opposition um, from the enemy, just, that's an encouragement. Paul tells that to the, uh, the church at um, Thessalonica in his second epistle. Um, verse 5, he says, this is a manifest token or a sign of your salvation, mm -hmm. right? He'd been up in Thessalonica after three Sabbaths. He was driven out by persecution. He works his way down through, uh, I think uh, Mike already referenced this, all the way down to Corinth. But he has a heart for these new believers. He had to leave them so quickly. And the word of their testimony came all the way from Macedonia down to Achaia. Man, and we hear about you guys up there in Thessalonica. You're dynamic. You're living for the Lord despite all this opposition. And Paul says, that's a manifest token of your salvation. If you aren't saved, you wouldn't do it. But the fact that you're going on in faith in the midst of persecution is a sign to you that you truly are saved. And so that should be encouragement. By the way, uh, Paul says something very similar at the end of Philippians chapter 1 also. All right, so continue serving despite opposition, a great example to follow. Self-sacrificing, Mark 3, verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. There's been times I've been at conferences and people keep coming up and talking to you and talking to you, and sometimes I have actually missed meals because I've been talking with people. But that's about as bad as it gets at a conference. This is a day-to-day -day thing with the Lord. He's serving so much, he doesn't even have time to eat. He's pouring himself out. Self-sacrificing. He's a good manager. So we read that in Mark 6, 7, when he sends out his disciples uh, two by two, he's a good administrator. He's putting them together two by two. And then at the, the feeding of the 5,000, we read, and only Mark records this, that the Lord set the people in groups of 50 and 100. Mm -hmm. See, he's a good administrator. We don't get that in the other gospel accounts. Um, to be a good servant means you need to be a good administrator. Sometimes people will say, how can I get more out of my day? You know, how can I do more for the Lord? Well, I, I find in my own life that it's a constant priority of legitimately looking at everything we're doing at the way the Lord would look at it and say, this is the best, this is good, this is permissible, cutting it, throwing it away, cutting it, throw it away. In other words, if I'm, if I'm supplanting <coughs> the best with the good, I'm losing out. If I'm supplanting the good with permissible, I'm losing out. I just want to do the best for the Lord. And so the Lord will teach us uh, often about maximizing our time, how to be more efficient, being good managers of our time to get more out of our day instead of praying, oh, I wish I had more hours in the day to do what the Lord wanted me to do. The Lord, uh, Mark's example shows us he was a good manager. He's motivated by love. I already read Mark 1, 41. The Lord was moved with compassion. That's something that Mark brings up several times. I confess, I'm not often, I shouldn't say not often, I'm not always moved by compassion to serve others. Sometimes I feel, I just know I need to do that. 
But the more that we're in tune with the heart of Christ, we're going to have the compassion that Christ does for those in need. And I find that's a huge motivator. If I can truly love them as Christ loved them, then I'll want to serve them. Prayer preceded service. We see that in Mark 1.35. Prayerless ministry is a fruitless ministry. Uh, if we're not spending time with the Lord and relying on Him, what we're really saying is, Lord, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. And He'll teach us that that's not the case. And so we'll just close this time now by looking at how Mark closes his record. I find each of the four evangelists, as they're closing their presentation of Christ, each one has a unique closing which upholds their vantage point of a Savior. So the Lord has been crucified, he's been buried, he's been raised up, he has shown himself to his disciples. In verse 15, we have the commissioning. He says unto them, this is Mark 16, 15, Go into all the world, preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they shall cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly... It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. Now listen to verse 20. And they, and they went out and preached everywhere. That's what they were told to do, but mark this the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the company of signs. Isn't that wonderful? We have this serving Savior. He's been pouring himself out all through the gospel of Mark, compassionate seeing day after day after day. And now he commissions his uh, disciples, tells them to go out preaching. He's received up into heaven. So that's the ascension. And Mark could have closed his gospel there, but instead he adds one more verse. Yes, the Lord is in heaven. He's at, set down at the right hand of God. So we have this exalted uh, picture of Christ at the start of Mark and at the end of Mark, guarding against anyone thinking less of his deity. But it's not just that he's highly exalted in heaven. He's at the throne of God, working with us here on earth, laboring with us. And that's the message that Mark wants to give to those who read. Yes, he's in heaven. He's highly exalted, but he is still working with you down here. Amen? Amen. Father, we just want to thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for this wonderful example that we have of the, the compassionate servant, the one who's looking over, seeing where he can help others, having compassion, willing to touch, uh, being tenacious, being a good manager. Uh, being faithful no matter what the cost. Uh, Father, not exalting himself, uh, not looking for any popularity. We pray, Father, that we would be more like him in the ministries that you've called us to be, understanding that without him we can do nothing. Um, but as Paul says, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh God, our Father, we're thankful that we have a Savior in heaven so exalted, so powerful, but he's still laboring with us here on earth for the cause of the kingdom. And we just want to give you thanks in his name. Amen. 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 All right. Comments or questions?